By transcription, Bidwell McCormick takes you behind the scenes in Hollywood. You have a very good memory. One that reaches back to, say, the early 20s, when Eric von Stroheim first produced Universal's silent picture, Foolish Wives. And you have a great memory for detail. You probably be recognized in Universal's recent production, Frisco Sal, a very handsome carriage. Oh, that was the carriage of Emperor Franz Joseph, which was brought to America by Stroheim, for his picture and has been stored at the studio ever since. Yes, it is the same historical carriage, a Victoria, and despite its non-use for more than 20 years, it is still in excellent condition. Just why it is never used again until director George Wagner dug it out of storage and is not exactly known. But I dare see there are countless valuable antiques, unusual pieces of furniture, queer set pieces and the like which are gathering dust in more than one Hollywood studio. The reason for this, no doubt, is that the directors are reluctant to use the same pieces too often. And then, too, many are so individually suited to certain productions that they cannot be readily used again. Well, I'll bet a lot of people could get a big kick out of rummaging through the storage rooms of a Hollywood studio. Now, here are a few briefs about Hollywood productions and picture people. Jane Wyman has been making technicolor tests for Time, Place, and the Girl, in which she's scheduled to play opposite Dennis Morgan and Jack Carson. Barry Lyndon, who wrote The Amazing Dr. Plitterhouse, is scripting the Rita Wyman novel, One Man's Secret for Warner Brothers. Discretion should be exercised by women in copying screen styles, since very often what is fitting for a movie character is out of place in everyday life. So says Renee, the Hollywood stylist who has just completed a working girl's wardrobe for Lorraine Day in a recent film for RKO Radio. For those endearing young charms, Renee says, we did a typical business girl's wardrobe, gaining different effects by mixing jackets and skirts. And this type of change can be worked by anyone. But so many times we make things to emphasize a film role rather than for pure style. And that's when care should be taken in copying. Now, today's personality close-up is about Paulette Goddard. Nathan, do you think Hollywood stars thrive on flattery? Well, according to best observers, most of Hollywood's egocentric stars do thrive on flattery. But Paulette Goddard breaks the rule. She wants to hear about her faults the minute they develop. It's for this reason the Paramount star has with her on every set of all her pictures expert drama coach Phyllis Loughton, former actress and New York stage director. It's her job to find fault with Paulette at every opportunity and then to offer suggestions that will make for a smoother performance or the better reading of a line. But Miss Loughton's job as watchdog over Miss Goddard's work in no way clashes with that of the director of the picture in which the star is working. Mitchell Leeson, currently directing her in Kitty, feels that the personal coach system is one that every star in pictures could well use. Leeson says, a director has to keep in balance all the many elements of a screen or a production. Often he is watching the work of some supporting player at the moment the star does some little thing that could stand correcting. These are the things Miss Loughton watches for. Yes, and Miss Goddard has used this personal coaching system since the earliest days of her career. Long before I'd had any chance at all in pictures, Paulette tells us, I was reading scenes to one of the greatest actresses and coaches the theater has ever known. My teacher then, and my occasional teacher now, is Constance Collier. She's helped me in more ways than any other person in the world. Oh, then it is more than coincidence that Constance Collier has a leading part in Miss Goddard's current picture, Kitty. Yes, says Paulette. She and Phyllis, too, will be right at hand to keep me in line in all my future pictures if there's any way I can bring it about. And she adds, if I ever begin to feel that I'm too good to learn, a few lessons I want them here to tell me all about it. And now a word from your local announcer. By transcription, Bidwell McCormick takes you behind the scenes in Hollywood. I have been asked many times how to make a screen test. Well, I know of one actress who broke into the movies by screen testing herself. Well, that is certainly an unusual procedure. Who was that, and just how did he or she accomplish this amazing feat? There are a lot of movie-struck young women and some men yearning for that magic secret. Oh, it wasn't as easy as all that. The actress was Oza Masson, and it was in London that she gave herself the screen test, which won her a contract and started her on the road, which eventually led to Hollywood and featured roles such as she had in RKO's recent picture, The Master Race. Then, too, Oza had to learn a lot before being able to screen test herself. For one thing, 
she had to learn how to swing a camera so ably as to become a, a professional photographer at the Palladium Studios in her native Copenhagen. Then, when her chance came, she prepared the script, coached the electricians on lighting, coached the cameraman, directed herself, and finally edited the resultant film. Well, I don't recommend that as any shortcut to movie stardom because it must have taken a great deal of study and hard work to learn all these necessary techniques just to give yourself a screen test. You're right there. And she's the only person that I know of who has gone about getting a screen test in just that way. And now for a few production briefs. Edith Head will create the wardrobe for Ingrid Bergman in Leo McCary's production of RKO Radio's The Bells of St. Mary's. Playing the role of a nun in this picture, Miss Bergman will be co-starred with Bing Cosby. Miss Head will, in addition, design the wardrobes for the other principal feminine players who will be signed later. For the first time in more than 40 screen roles, makeup is applied to the face of Ki Luke, Chinese actor noted for his portrayals of Charlie Chan's number one son in the Chan series. Luke in makeup portrays a Korean orderly in a Jap prison camp in RKO Radio's First Man into Tokyo. For one of Lucille Bremer's dance dresses in Yolanda and the Thief, a Technicolor fantasy starring Fred Astaire, Metro Golden Mayor's Irene used all of the material available for it on the North American continent. To achieve an airy, floating effect, the dress was made of the most fragile material known, French manufactured souffle. Fifty yards of the gossamer like cloth were used representing the entire obtainable stock in the United States and Canada. And the dress weighs less than one pound. Pee Wee King and his Golden West Cowboys have been signed for Flaming Frontier, Monogram's current Western special starring Johnny Mac Brown with Raymond Hutton. Today, Nathan Hale is going to bring you the personality close-up of Nancy Kelly. Nancy thinks theater, which means show business in general, is the world in which... She was born and in which parents Jack Kelly, theater man, and Nan Walsh Kelly, actress, lived, and in which she has lived also. She's well-educated, speaks faultless English, knows literature, painting, music, and the fine arts. She's also very fond of sports, shoots golf in the lower 80s, rides well, and is particularly graceful on a thoroughbred jumper. She suffers keenly from acrophobia, never looks out of a window when she's in a tall building. Gardenias are her favorite flower. The Moonlight Sonata, her favorite classical selection, and, of course, she's superstitious. Walking under ladders and lighting three on a match are the deadliest hoodoos, she thinks. Knocking on wood, however, for her nullifies most of these hexes. Nancy always goes in for a film role with a wholehearted enthusiasm and thoroughness. For her U.S. counter-espionage agent in Betrayal from the East, she studies all sorts of spy fiction and non-fiction to get ideas about how spies act. He's five feet, five inches tall, weighs a slim 113 pounds. She has dark blue eyes. She has a habit of looking intently at anyone without whom, with whom she is talking. She has the roadshow artist happy-go-lucky philosophy. And now, your local announcer. By transcription, Bidwell McCormick takes you behind the scenes in Hollywood. Very clever, these motion picture technicians. You just can't seem to get them into a corner that they cannot get out of. I know they've pulled themselves out of some very serious situations. What do you have in mind now? Oh, I was thinking of the instance very recently when director Michael Curtis found himself in a horrible spot while filming Roughly Speaking, the Rosalind Russell Jack Carson feature for Warner Brothers. He had shot all around a certain railroad station sequence, and then, when he finally got around to it, he found that the train could be pulled out only in one direction, and that was to the left, whereas to fit the story as film, it just had to depart to the right. When negative film stock is rationed and time and labor are of such importance, he was in the spot. Well, while Curtis was busy wondering just what he could do and how he could get away with tearing down half of the studio to make room for the necessary action, a property man brought forth a huge mirror. So the scene was shot as reflected therein, backwards. Yes. The film was then reversed for printing, and everything came out right side up and perfect. And now here are a few production briefs and items about what the stars are doing. Allotment Wives has been set as the second monogram feature to star Kay Francis and to be produced jointly by herself and Jeffrey Bernard. 
Rita Corday, Tahiti-born beauty of Swiss French parentage, will play opposite Tom Conway in RKO Radio's The Falcon in San Francisco, the 11th screen story of Michael Arlen's Debonair Snoot. Not only will Van Johnson and Esther Williams do their first dancing on the screen in Metro Golden Mayor's Early to Wed, but they'll also introduce a new dance. What's more, they'll sing to its music and in Spanish. The new dance is a Colombian bambuco, a South American waltz or three-four rhythm, previously unknown to this country. Actually, it's a variation of the now familiar rumba. In one of the lavish settings for Warner Brothers' forthcoming drama, Hotel Berlin was the loveliest bed. It sat upon a plush platform two steps above the floor. It had silken draperies. It was colorful and ruffled. It was fluffy. It was lavish. In fact, it was out of this world, according to Miss King, who couldn't resist jumping kerplop right into the middle of it. But alas, there were no springs. Just plain boards, and Miss King learned the hard way that there have been no springs in anything at the studio since Pearl Harbor. Hotel Berlin features Faye Emerson, Helmut Dandine, Andrea King, and many other favorites. And today's personality close-up is of Robert Benchley. His plucky sense of humor was not recognized even at Harvard, nor until he had uh, tried his hand at various occupations. He became drama editor of the Old Life comic magazine and later joined the staff of the New Yorker. His pungent comments won him a national reputation. Then he wrote several bestsellers, hundreds of short articles, appeared in a musical com comedy on the radio and in famous series of short film subjects. His work in feature pictures has made him enormously popular and his recent credits include Janie, Practically Yours, and RKO Radio's latest tune film, Pan Americana in which he's a traveling magazine editor. He shares top honors with Philip Terry and Audrey Long. He's also credited, I believe, as making the first all-talking film called The Treasurer's Report. Yes. This short was made as an experiment to see if audience attention could be held for an all-talking picture. <laughs> Just imagine, wondering if audience attention could be held for an all-talking picture. But that was better than 15 years ago. And now...